my God, it's October, October the 1st, 2021. History is moving forward. We're living, according to Keith Tier, not only in history, but in historic times. Keith, what's happening this week? Why have you become a historian this week or taking a historical perspective? Yes. Uh, uh, well, uh, because most of the content this week in the newsletter relates to major events that are happening that suggest a different future. Um, the biggest of all being um, a conversation around Facebook now now at 2.9 billion voluntary users of their operating system. At least you didn't system. make Facebook your startup of the week this week. You acknowledge it's not I... a startup anymore, Keith. Well, compared to what it could become, which is, uh, here, here's, here's the title of the newsletter, a global operating system, question mark. But I, I did include YouTube and Twitter, and you probably have to put Alibaba and a bunch of other stuff in there. Yeah. Maybe even this week, maybe even this week's Startup of the Week should be in there. Um, and uh, But, you know, there is increasingly evidence that technology is globalizing. 2.9 billion voluntary members of, of, of a platform is kind of incredible. It's it's either the world's biggest democracy or, as Adrienne Lafrance says in her Atlantic piece, the world's biggest autocracy. Although autocracies don't tend to be voluntary associations, so that seems unlikely. But the conversation is, what is going on? Uh, uh, what is actually happening in front of our eyes? 50 years from now, looking back, what will history have been? Because whatever the answer is, is happening right now. Yeah, I... I... I think it's interesting what you say, but there are two. My, I have two caveats or objections. Firstly, the fact that people use Facebook to keep up with the news or connect with their friends or, or relatives, I, I don't think means it's a community. It's just a, I don't know what you call it. Platform, I think for a lot of these people, it's just the internet. Uh, I don't think they even distinguish between Facebook and the internet. Um, and the second thing, and this is a, a bigger issue that you and I continually argue about is for all your wishful thinking about the end of the government and the state and all this stuff governments around the world particularly china are becoming stronger and stronger so i don't see any evidence of global of world government and if anything ethnic rivalry ethnic tension nationalism is on the rise too well i i, I think you're right descriptively you're right but i also think that at every moment of change there's a moment of resistance well, but let's and talk they, about the first objection first, about it. Yeah, you, I've heard this for years. Oh, Facebook's the biggest country in the world. It's bigger than India. It's bigger than China, blah, blah. But it's not a country. It's just a network, a platform where people communicate with one another. It, people don't pay well, taxes that, on, on Facebook. They don't have any uh, accountability or responsibility. They don't go to school on Facebook. Mm -hmm. So, so let's just accept that Facebook isn't a country. Um, it, the number of people using it is now bigger than India and China combined. And okay, it's, I take that. But so and the, and the revenue is fifty-four billion, which is there are very few countries in the world that have larger GDP. Well, Apple than has bigger revenue probably than Facebook, doesn't it? So does Amazon. Yeah, that's true. I agree. The size of the companies <laughs> is a big deal, but I, I just don't see. Well, I, no, but I'm, what I, what I'm what, but what I'm asking you to kind of grapple with is, um, what are the implications? I mean, put it this way: if I was to say to you, Andrew, do you think nation states are permanent for the entire rest of human existence, or do you think we'll ever reach a point at which? Um, uh, there's something above nation states, something more global that is authoritative. I think probably we'd all say, yes, that's likely to happen at some point. I would, say, I would say it depends on extraterrestrial threats. I think the only way you'll have real, any kind of serious world government is if something appears from the outside that will bring people together. Otherwise, I see no evidence. The United Nations has been such a catastrophe. Um, I just don't well, see any... I, I mean, you know, obviously, forever is a long time, but I would, I would bet that there won't be. That's my guess. Well, so let me ask you a different then. Would it represent progress if there was something? No, I don't think it would. 
Right. So that so that's all we really disagree on. I, I think it would represent progress. Well, you want someone like Boutros, Boutros, Ghali to run the whole world. I mean, how, how would it even work? Mark Zuckerberg? Well, how, how it would work is what my editorial ends with. There's a bunch of questions in it and, and no one knows the answer. Um, and it definitely wouldn't be a Boutros, Boutros, Ghali with distributed computing and rules based the uh, digi- uh, yeah, um, distributed autonomous organizations, yeah. probably it wouldn't be a person. It probably wouldn't be a person. It would be a system, which is why I call this week's newsletter a global operating system. I don't think it would be a person at all. I think what we're looking at is the end of government, not just the end of nation states, but the end of government as we know it. But we're talking the long term. We're talking about the early infrastructure that would make such a thing, even the, even the fact we can talk about it and not be totally weird tells you something is happening that, that is there. So I, I, well, I do it's think... Been, you know, it's been discussed, H, H.G. Wells discussed it. I mean, it's been discussed for hundreds of years. I don't think it's that new an idea. It's just, I don't see how... Uh, Einstein, Einstein talked about it very explicitly, actually. Right. But what about... Um, something weird is going on where I accept that you're right about these distributed autonomous organizations. They're interesting. I accept you're right that these uh, global companies, they're basically multinational companies, are more and more powerful and interesting and relevant in our lives. But you also have simultaneously the rise of strong governments. So they're all going together. Yeah, They're going together because that, so back to the earlier point, um, Wherever there's change, there's resistance. I, I think nation states are incredibly insecure. And insecurity is, is probably the, the right what word. What does that mean, insecure? Uh, fearful that their authority is being eroded without them having an ability to shift uh, and, and correct that. So, so they overreact. So China, China's reaction to Bitcoin, which is an outright ban now uh, since last week, clearly is an overreaction. Um, uh, America and Lena Khan, the very fact that Lena Khan is in the job she's in represents, in my view, an overreaction. Well, that's because you're but, a you know, 65-year-old sexist. You just can't accept the fact that a younger woman's smarter than you. That's absurd. Uh, just because, I, I, you know, she went to I'm Yale trying- Law School. She's, uh, she's highly respected in the scholarly community. It's just absurd for you to even say that about Lena Khan. I mean, there's, she's... No, 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 I'm not measuring... anybody else. No. No, no, but let's not lose the theme. I mean, don't get lost in the Lena Khan thing. The, the main point is nation states are overreacting to these global organizations. Well, which yeah, coming fear. back to Lena Khan or the antitrust stuff, that's come up before. I mean, it came up at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, and the state won. They, they, won, they won over big yeah. oil. They won over big the, banking. They won over big agro, at least for a while. So there's no reason why they can't win again. The, the state will always win battles because it's powerful. Ultimately, it has armies. So, of course, it wins. But it doesn't mean it represents the future. It represents the past, the past defending its existence. And, but also, uh, I also think that most, if, if you were to poll people on Facebook or something and you said, would you like to live in a, a world run by Facebook or one of these other distributed or autonomous networks? Most people would either shake their heads or be completely confused. Most people want laws. They want order. They want the police. They want taxation. They want roads. They want health care. Maybe outside yeah. a few libertarian yeah, just, citizens in America. So, so don't, I don't yeah, know where, don't the, miss- where the demand is for world government. Yeah, don't, don't misunderstand me. I do not want a world run by Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, or, or any of, of the others. Peter at Thiel. All. Uh, or Peter Thiel. But, but, Peter I, Thiel but I do believe that uh, in the absence of a coherent human plan, the, they will end up running a lot of the world. When t- well, when they 2. are 9- running it. I mean, that's, the, the, I think you're yeah, right so, there. Well, well, so then you can't confront that with the status quo. You can't say, I don't like that, therefore let's keep things the way they are. What you need is a better plan for a global future. But I think what's happening is different in China and the US. In the US, because the state's so weak and dysfunctional, 
you've got companies like Amazon, for example, sort of rewriting healthcare law and rethinking a lot of the infrastructure of the state. Whereas in China, the state's actually quite strong. There's a two, 3,000 year history of a strong state. I don't think there's a lot of questioning of that. So I think there are two narratives going on. In, in America, you've had this sort of unraveling of the state, weak state and all the problems associated with it. In China, you have a, 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 a stronger state, which, and I think that's where the really interesting conflict's happening between the Chinese state and the digital networks. As you say, I think their attempt to clamp down on Bitcoin, on that, on Didi Chang, on all these networks, that's where the history, the early history of the 21st century is going to get made. I don't know who's going to win. Yeah, and I, uh, I, I think there's micro histories and then there's macro history, and I agree with you on micro history. Uh, although I, I think there are common threads between. You're right about the difference between the states, but I do think there are common threads between the impetus for uh, antitrust here and the impetus for anti big tech in China are are driven by a common underlying fear of the future where the bureaucracies who run the state don't see their role um, uh, as, as being, you know, a, a, as evolving in a good way. They see their role as being undermined. Um, and, and it is being undermined because just think, just think of in our life, the internet uh, as, a, as a network carrying bits, which led to content. And think about the world we live in today, the world of content we live in today, where you know we we're reading things by David Runciman from the London Review of Books here in the United States. Um, back in the day, we would have to have a subscription that took three weeks to come in the mail. Yeah, I, I know all that, but 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 I think in America, people are waking up to the fact that that's all true, that's undeniable. But the need for roads and bridges and decent hospitals and schools, none of that's changed. None of that has changed. And, you know, you could argue that the operating system we currently have to fix that is broken. I mean, look, look at what happened last night in Washington, D.C. in relationship right. well, to in the America, $1 trillion. It's really broken, yeah, I mean, but the interesting thing about America is it can remain a, an economic powerhouse and its politics just becomes increasingly dysfunctional. And I'm not sure. I mean, it's the press is obsessed with it. But I'm yeah. not sure if it really actually makes that much difference. America can get, America's never been a particularly political country. Um, it's always been founded on sort of anti-political, almost libertarian grounds. So it stumbles along and it continues to be successful, at least in economic terms. So I'm not even sure whether America's political, unless it results in actual civil war, I'm not sure how important it is. So, so. Um, yeah, I think there's some merit in what you're saying, but I, I also think critical thinkers have to start asking the question what they want the future to look like, not just bash the present. Yeah, have well, a plan. No, one, have a plan. no one would argue. I, I wouldn't argue with it. That's, that's given. I mean, well, we have well, to well, use this opportunity, Keith, to get your son into it because... You don't always bring your kids into your newsletter, but your son is a star. He's making history too this week. What's your son up to? Uh, he passed his driver's test yesterday, and uh, I used I used uh, uh, I, I should tell you Liam is a. It is your uh, middle son. He's my middle son. I adore him, and um, he's very. He has anxiety issues, and so he gets very very anxious, and he's really brave. He's learned how to deal with anxiety. He's self-aware about it. And mm -hmm. you can imagine uh, on the way to the driver's test, he, uh, he was full of anxiety. So in, in my editorial, he plays the role of the US or the Chinese uh, elite who are themselves full of anxiety. And um, he, he, he toughed it out. Um, he took the test, which was already a challenge because a lot of, of what was inside him was to run away and not even take it. And um, he passed with only one point against him. So he actually overachieved. The woman at the counter said she's never seen a one he said that, uh, in terms of the number of errors on the test. Very so, good. Uh, and, and, and even after that, he said he lucked out. He wasn't prepared to take the win. 
and and be happy about it. He said, no, I looked out. She, it the, reminds the, me of uh, my daughter. She's similarly anxious. I think you've been in California too long, Keith. You, I think you believe in a world beyond anxiety. And I think the big difference is uh, the great philosopher of modern politics was Thomas Hobbes, 17th century Englishman. And he believed that politics should be founded on fear. And I always think that there are two kinds of people, those who believe we can get beyond fear and those who believe that fear is the core human reality and we have to build a political system around it. I'm a hardcore Hobbesian. I don't think you are. Well, no, I, I, I like fear and I like failure as engines of inspiration. Um, I, I, so I, 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 I'm very, uh, you know, I live in the same room as fear. But um, I, my reaction to fear is to plan. And, 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 yeah, and I think that's... You can drive off fear. And for you, fear is sort of almost like your operating system. But it's not really fear. It's more of a sort of a, I don't know, a gambling instinct or something as a startup, as a perennial startup guy. Uh, it, uh, well, to be really personal about it, it's driven, you know, I would, I was, uh, this is, I'll do the short version of this, but I, I, I was raised with an alcoholic dad who beat my mum up in a council estate as the oldest of six kids. And making things better was a constant challenge. And I grew up wanting to make things better. Instead of succumbing to my environment, um, the environment made me, actually. And, and that is deep in me. So whenever I confront any problem, even if I, I have fear, my, 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 you know, my attempt is always to make things better. And so when I look at nation states and Facebook and YouTube and this kind of canvas that we're all living on, I can imagine a better future from that. And I can start to put pieces of it together, only pieces of it. Mm. And you know, my, my call to action would be, let's start thinking about that. Instead, instead of pointing the finger and picking out faults, which there are many to pick out, so you could spend your whole life doing that. Let, mm. let well, focus, that. Yeah. Let's focus. Yeah. Let's focus on matter. how to do that. So uh, speaking of Hobbes, my old friend David Runciman, professor of politics at Cambridge University, has a really good piece out, which you include in the newsletter this week on Peter Thiel. He's a Hobbesian, deeply, deeply knowledgeable about Hobbes. Uh, and he has a really interesting take on squaring the circle between Thiel's libertarianism and his successful kind of appropriation or assault on the state. And this is a theme that we've talked about earlier in the show today, the fact that two things seem to be simultaneously going on. Stronger states and also the rise of libertarian thinking and libertarian companies on, on the edge. Yeah. Yeah. But well, again, both things exist simultaneously. Um, you know, if, if you think about the insurrection on January the 6th, those were people who want um, an authoritarian state that is, you know, uh, supports white Americans. Um, and at the same time, you've got... Can, I, like, can I just jump in here? I would argue those are the people who... Those are the people who think they live on Facebook and walk around with their cameras and think by posting stuff in live on Facebook, they're actually making history when, in fact, they're just making fools of themselves. But that's another issue. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, we... 2.9 billion people live on Facebook and they're not all those people, but you're right. Those people are included as a subgroup. Um, now, Runciman uh, is, is reviewing the same book we talked about last week um, uh, in the London Review of Books. And, yeah. and it's, it's a fantastic piece that does a better job of last week's reviewer from The Economist in stripping apart to the bare bones who is Peter Thiel? And actually, he argues that Peter Thiel is not a libertarian, but is actually an opportunist capitalist seeking to present himself as a libertarian in I, order I to... I don't buy that. I think that what Runciman is arguing is, because he's not a friend of libertarianism, I think he's arguing that kind of almost inevitably within it, libertarian thought is this desire to take power and take over the state, which is what Thiel's doing with 
organizations like Palantir? It, I, I think it's the, the reason it's complicated is I don't think any of these people really have thought through who they are. They're not right. Hobbes. They're not as thorough as Hobbes. Yeah, to be in fair to Theo, I mean, none of us like him, but he is an incredibly smart guy. And if anyone thinks this stuff through, it's him. Right. But even with him, so let I would reduce it down to the individual. Um, you and I are both Brits, and we all, always remember Margaret Thatcher saying there is no such thing as society. Um, the individual is the center of the world for Peter Thiel. Now, the, the fact is the individual can't be free except in the context of society. The idea that you could have a free individual uh, unencumbered by relationships to other individuals through structures is, is a dream. Uh, individuals belong. Uh, now, freedom, therefore, is a measure of their independence from need, in my view, whereas Thiel would say it's their independence from the state. Okay, but I, I tell you that, but j just explain what Runciman is arguing, because it's really interesting. Well, he argued, I don't know which bit you want me to uh, talk but about. I, I think the thing that's really interesting is that, and, and this is what, uh, Runciman is very influenced by this Robert Nozick book, uh, who's the sort of father or the sort of pioneer of, of, of late 20th century libertarian thought. Um, and what Runciman argues is that Thiel's sort of entrepreneurial instincts are to recognize, and this comes back to the earlier theme in America, this weak state, this unraveling state, this dysfunctional state. And what entrepreneurs have been really good at is assaulting the state. He has a term for it. It's not assault. It's, I can't remember what the term, do you remember the term? Uh, no. They have a term, but, and in a funny way, whilst Runciman argues that Thiel and Zuckerberg are different, and that he actually sees Zuckerberg as being a little bit more profound and historic. Zuckerberg's also doing the same thing. They're, and this comes back to your argument at the beginning, and I think in a sense you're right. These people sniff blood. They can sniff the unraveling of the state, whether it's Teal kind of using Palantir to replace the CIA or take over the CIA, whether it's Zuckerberg's attempt to replace government itself, they all sniff the same opportunity. And it's the ultimate entrepreneurial opportunity because the state is a monopoly. And we know Thiel's biggest obsession it, 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 for entrepreneurs in his zero to one is that all entrepreneurs, quite rightly, should want to become monopolists. So by logical oh. thinking, all entrepreneurs should want to control the state. And it seems so that, kind of absurd and science fictional, but that might be what's happening. Uh, I yeah. So therefore, he isn't really a libertarian, right? Is, is well, but me. that's his point: is that when you peel away at the libertarians, that's what you find: this assault on the state. And yeah, he, he talks about um, unregulated markets and state capitalism being being actually the best friends. Because if you get rid of regulation, which is the state, um, uh, it becomes open season for Teal and Palantir to that's go. Good. All of them, and and these are them are all doing the same thing, whether they're going up in space in, in replacement of NASA, whether uh, Vizos is, is rewriting American health care. They're all doing the same thing. It's the same I, broad yeah. crisis. Uh, I, I would say there's another narrative that I find more compelling. I, I, do, agree, I do agree that Runciman is uh, hitting the nail on the head in his analysis there, but I think there's a context that it fits into that's even more compelling, which is um, really, really since the Enlightenment, to go back a long way, um, and, and the, the 20th century, the two world wars, fascism, uh, the rise of the Soviet Union and China, uh, and then the end of the Cold War, what's happened is the, the, the erosion of any vision for society and the increasing... Um, power-centric uh, uh, focus of various bureaucracies means we're living through a time of extreme pragmatism where there is no vision really for the future. What there is is what to do next uh, from the point of view of preserving your power. And, and almost every institution 
has had its authority undermined because of that. Look at the Supreme Court, which is now a political plaything, where instead of talking about law and what's right, you talk about conservative versus liberal judges. That, that is a sign that that institution has lost its way and, uh, in terms of its function. So I think we're living through a time of um, massive lack of authority anywhere. That's that- where, of course, tech. So let's get back to tech, Keith, because this is not a political philosophy show. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a couple more of, your, of the articles you, you, um, you cite. Apparently, advertising's dead. Everything seems to be dead these days. The nation state, even advertising, surely that's not wrong. So, so the advertising is dead actually is looking at um, Apple's success um, as evidence from Facebook's public statements. Let me just go and uh, scroll to it and find it. Uh, here, here we are. Um, this, is, this is a story that uh, came out of Medium, uh, One Zero, which is a great publication. And it's talking about um, uh, uh, the various networks are now um, unable to target us due to Apple's anti-tracking initiative being successful. Brilliant. And, I think that's something that we should... I, I know you're probably not very happy about it. I'm thrilled, even though it's probably against my interests as a somewhat of a startup entrepreneur. But I think it's a good thing. Uh, no, I actually think it's a good thing as well. We, 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 we don't disagree there. Uh, I, I've never wanted to build businesses that were supported by advertising ever. Um, uh, I always like subscription or selling something like SaaS um, or earlier in my life enterprise stuff where you get paid. But um, uh, So advertising has never been very attractive to me and it always feels as if if you build a business based on advertising, inevitably you're going to do bad things even if you don't mean to. So it's a good thing. Do you think it's real, though? Is there going to be a split in the internet between sort of some sort of Apple network and a Google network, Google Facebook network? No, I think they'll just work around it eventually and find, you know, they'll basically either have a worse product that targets poorly yeah. or not at all, but they'll, they still are going to be dependent on advertising. Yeah, um, and I think, unfortunately, so often in these situations, it's the wealthy and the smart people like you and I who can afford to pay not to see advertising. And it's the, the poor, the yeah. less informed, the less powerful, those without agency, they're the ones who are going to get inundated with advertising. They don't know how to get out of it and they can't afford to get out of it. So this sort of attention yeah. economy and advertising is going to hit the poor even harder than television or the early internet. Yep. 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 You, we agree, Keith. We agree too much today. What about um, what about work life imbalance? Are we going back to work? Apple's influential here, too. Apple is, you know, for all its low keyness, it's still an incredibly influential company in terms of Silicon Valley and fashion and tendencies. Right. Yeah, this is, this is actually Apple uh, in the role of bad guy, whereas the previous story was Apple in the role of good guy, which shows you how you have to actually think. You can't become an Apple fan because uh, they do bad stuff too. And this is Apple not understanding that the world has changed in terms of what office spaces and insisting that at some point it's all going to go back to the way it was before COVID, when in fact, we, I think we all know that that isn't going to happen. Um, I think it will myself. I think COVID is one of the more overrated things. And in about three or four years, everyone would have forgotten about it. But that's another issue. And the key phrase is this. Apple's normally heads down employees are pushing back in an unprecedented way. They've created two petitions demanding the option to work remotely full time that have collected over a thousand signatures combined, which I guess is not a big number. It's not a lot. I mean, how many people work at Apple? A handful of people have resigned over the matter, and some employees have begun speaking out publicly to criticize management stance. They can always go well, and work somewhere else. And, and will, probably. I, I think the employers that win this next era are going to be employers that recognize that level of flexibility. But do you think that it... I mean, most senior people never go to the office anyway, and even pre-COVID. Yeah, but it's not about senior people. It's about everyone. Um, Is it about uh, trust? Do the people, does Apple want people to go back because they don't trust them messing around at home? Or is it just the old bureaucracy? I mean, talk about archaic 
dinosaur irrelevant people. HR, if we only could get rid of HR, then the world would certainly be a better place, wouldn't it? Yeah, well, this is another example of not planning the future in the present and thinking the past is the right place to look. And uh, it, so it's very similar to the previous conversation. And Apple is playing the role of the backward-looking element here. Uh, I, I do surprising, think, really. Yeah. Do you think if Jobs was around, it's one thing he sees clearly. I, I can't imagine him being behind this. Who knows? Who knows? Who can read the mind of Hobbes? Jobs or Hobbes? <laughs> oh, I thought, Hobbes. Said, Hobbes. I thought you said. I thought you said Hobbes. No. Jobs. Steve well, job, no, Jobs was um, definitely, uh, you know, a kind of a platonic um, kind of authoritarian. Um, uh, well, he what, wanted what, the office to become a, a sort of like a, a place where you rebel. So he wanted his cake and eat it. He wanted everyone right. to come in and then yeah. turn against the company. Well, that that is the positive kernel inside Apple's response, which is they say that creativity is random and happens face to face. And I think there's truth in that. And Jobs but was then, a strong believer in that. That's why they put that screen back. That's why they've designed that ugly looking building so that people see each other all the time. The exactly. Sort of not style. The problem is, is they're not only seeing each other, but they're being watched. Anyway, Keith, uh, startup of the week. There is an interesting startup this week and it's not Apple. And it's fortunately, it's not Facebook. Yeah, the startup of the week uh, that I chose this week is, um, let me tell you a story first. But when, they, when this startup was presenting at TechCrunch Disrupt, um, Matthew Prince and his co-founder, Michelle, were, uh, had to go through a training session in the offices of Sequoia Capital. Yeah. And, and um, I was the mentor that helped them understand how to present their story on the stage, because what they do is hard to explain. They, they basically are a network operating system. Talking about global operating system, yeah. they, they, they basically are the provider of a global operating system. Uh, here they are now. It's Cloudflare. And They've got a great name. I never quite understood, but what does that mean? Great name. Well, um, the the name I don't think means anything. It's cloud no, I mean, does. What does a global doesn't. operating system mean? Sounds well, good. So what they so here's what they do. The the internet works on something called the domain name system, right? Um, which you're an expert on. They they say to you, please let us run your DNS. So you give them all the tools they need to run your DNS. All of your traffic to your website, to your email, goes through them, and they get rid of bad actors on their net. This on their sounds network. like a Keith Tear play. It, it's very Riding, close. You know, finding this is like a, a trillion dollar opportunity. You basically hijack the entire traffic of the internet. But, which, is, which is now what they've done. They now represent more than a third of all traffic on the internet. So are they They're, competitors to AWS or are they another piece underneath AWS? They are, they are a more, uh, here it's called the modular cloud. They are, ba and this is from uh, Stratechery, um, uh, um, this drawing to give credit. Um, they basically announced R2 this week, which uh, Amazon's storage system is called S3. So they lowered the S to an R and lowered the 3 to a 2. And they call it R2. And it's basically a global file storage system. Um, and bit by bit, they're building global infrastructure. That okay, is so not I, I mean, it's interesting, but just very in very simple terms, are they an alternative or a competitor to Amazon Web Services? Both, both. But they don't have the full range of products but yet. Who do they sell to? Tell me what they have um, and who would buy they, their they thing. They sell to anybody who runs an internet service, anybody. Like internet Apple, service, like uh, well, anything that runs on the internet. So, I'll give you an example. A big example is Apple's iOS 15 on the new iPhones that launched last week has a feature called Private Relay, which uh, hides your IP number so that Google and Facebook can't see it. They use Cloudflare to achieve that. So, it's really deep. It's a deep plumbing company. It's a sort it's of plumbing deep, beneath the, Amer Amazon Web Services. Very deep plumbing, which is what a global operating system is made up of.
And it's not a central authority, it's a, it's a utility. But what? But but again, explain what what's the value? What are they actually doing? Why would people but, want to use? Well, it? The, the value is making traffic arrive faster and free of interference. So, who is the company that used to do that? This the one that always used to promise to speed up. Uh, I can't remember. There are all the, these infrastructure companies, and they're all plumbing in the cloud. Yeah. Cloudflare's really pulled it off over, by the way, over a long period of time. When, when, when I was standing in that room with the founders, it was more than 10 years ago. They're now a public company. Um, we, can, we can check, but I think, uh, I think they're worth, let's just check, Cloudflare um, is worth $35 billion. Uh, and it was a startup without any funding when I was sat in that room with them. So you should have become their CEO. No, they have a perfectly good CEO. And uh, I should have been I've their chairman. My, I've, I've got an equally big idea that I'm the CEO of. So um, we'll stick mm. to my one. Well, interesting. I'm still not entirely sure, but it's, you've got to understand, you've got to be a plumber to understand this stuff, right? It's so complicated. I, yeah. And I think you've got to be a plumber to conceptualize a global operating system. You have to be. Uh, it's like, yeah. what, what do people need to be truly independent of authority and get done what they want to get done? So you always manage to get the conversation back to your libertarian ideology. Finally, Keith, tweet of the week. Tweet of the week this week is um, a doozy, shall we say. Uh, I don't ever use that expression, a doozy, but they do here in America. What does it mean? Uh, Not a plumbing term. I think it means something like it's awesome, but um, yeah. it's from Chris Dixon. Chris is was an angel investor. He spent many years now at Andreessen Horowitz as a venture capitalist. He yeah. does a lot of a lot of their interesting stuff in crypto, and he did a, a a whole thread this week, and it's it's just four words: why Web three matters. And if you click on it, uh, which I can do you will find a whole treatise, uh, one, two, three, you know, one after the other, uh, a narrative on what is going on. And uh, it's relevant because this is basically some of the narrative that would underline the conversation about what a global operating system has to yeah. That's all be the same of. stuff that we've been talking about today and previous weeks. Yeah, it's very good. Uh, I strongly recommend clicking He's on that good. link. He's good. So uh, he, does he believe it's happening, Web3? Yeah. It, not only that, he's funding a lot of it. Is is that term Web3? It's not Web3.0, which is good because – but is Web3, yeah. do you think that will catch on? Is that – or are we going to come up with a different word to describe what's happening? I mean, it, it's 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 the world of blockchain, essentially, right? It's It's – uh, it's not it's, it's it's distributed not, autonomous networks. Yeah, uh, it's, blockchain, it's blockchain plus data analytics plus AI um, right. plus the cloud. Um, you know, it, it's basically a lot of things. But it's, but AI was it, in Web two o. I mean, in 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 mature Web two o. Yeah. Well, last week we called it the end of the company, the end of the startup, which we talked about as being the end of the need for a company. Web three can create value without um, that in and of itself is interesting in the context of governance. Yeah, it's so ironic. I mean, the reason I believe in something coming after web 2.0, I don't know what it call it, whether we call it web three or something else, but when it's announced in a, by venture capitalists who invest in companies as the end of the company, I'm extremely skeptical, but that's enough. I think for this week, Keith, great show as always. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, next week, we can talk more about Web3, the end of the state, and the beginning, as Keith wants it, of world government. Have a great week, Keith. See you next week. Bye, everyone.